About 60 years ago, car companies set out on a mission to sell as many SUVs and trucks as possible. Let me be more specific. About 60 years ago, American car companies set out on a mission to sell as many SUVs and trucks as possible. After the chicken tax took effect in 1962, American car companies had no real competition when it came to any vehicles in the light trucks category, and after the oil crisis of 1973, introducing strong competition from Japan, American automotive giants set their sights on the market space that had the least regulations in terms of safety and emissions, that being SUVs and trucks. Since then, car companies have used scare tactics and other clever marketing to push SUVs and trucks on us for one reason only, money. And it seems to have worked pretty well for them considering that 80% of new car sales in the US are SUVs and trucks. 80 freaking percent. But there are still some major problems with SUVs and trucks that car companies don't like to talk about. Things like the overly stiff chassis that makes them less safe to be in, despite their size, or that the bumpers in SUVs and trucks are not crash compatible with other vehicles, again making them less safe. Since car companies don't like to talk about this though, I will run you through the major issues of SUVs and trucks, all resulting from a few regulation changes that car companies lobbied for. Hello people of the internet, I'm Nico, a big fan of station wagons, and someone who also wants a minivan powered by a helicopter engine. And this is why SUVs and trucks need to go. And speaking of going, I'm going to go too before I get mobbed by any local rednecks. I'll start the lesson with SUVs and trucks biggest problem, safety, or rather the lack thereof. Yes, that's right, the lack of safety. And it's actually quite simple. You see, when you watch videos of cars being crash tested, you'll have noticed the crumpling of the front end of the car. That's not a weak car, that is done deliberately because at the end of the day, a car is replaceable and you are not. So car companies spend years and years and millions of dollars developing crumple zones to best protect you and your dog. Who's jumped the fence again, by the way? For regular cars, they are also designed to be more forgiving to pedestrians, something that SUVs and trucks famously suck at, but I'll get to that later. The more pressing issue for SUVs and trucks is something called Crash compatibility. I'm pretty sure that's how it's spelled, and it sounds complicated, but it's actually very straightforward. If there are two sedans in a head-on collision, the bumpers and the crumple zones behind them are on the same level because passenger cars have regulations on how high the bumper can be off the ground. So in the event of an accident, the crumple zones of both cars can work together like so. Imagine the springs that I taped on are the crumple zones. When both vehicles have bumpers at the same height, there is now double the cushioning for both vehicles. But with SUVs and trucks, they don't have the same regulations. This results in the bumpers not aligning, meaning the crumple zones don't meet and cannot work together as effectively to keep the occupants safe. And that's just part one of the dangers of SUVs and trucks. The second part comes with the construction of SUVs and trucks. Granted, it's more difficult to solve this problem for the simple reason that trucks, by nature, are work vehicles that have to carry heavy stuff and therefore need a strong frame that can bear the load. Unfortunately, because of this, and this goes for large SUVs sharing the same construction, the stiff chassis acts like a battering ram in the crash. You might think this is a good thing, you've seen it in the movies, it means you can push danger out of the way. Slow down, let me spell this out for you. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E-W-R-O-N-G. You're wrong, and here's why. Yes, you can push stuff out of the way, but if you have a stiff chassis that acts like a battering ram, whatever crumple zones have been built into the hood and other components are rendered pretty much useless if the chassis is too stiff to give way. Basically, you can think about it as the difference between, whoops, punching a wall with or without a glove. There we go. That should be clean enough. So yes, in the event that you hit a smaller car where that car is now your crumple zone, you will be fine. You probably ended the other person, but you will be fine. However, 
As SUVs and trucks get increasingly popular, the odds of hitting another truck or an SUV get way greater, and then you're toast because now you have two very heavy vehicles with less functional crumple zones hitting one another. Think of it as two battering rams hitting each other head on. There's very little cushioning for the occupants. Now, on the topic of heavy vehicles hitting things, allow me to teach you some entry-level physics and explain to you why you thought SUVs and trucks are safer. Don't worry, there's not a gajillion formula to memorize, but there is one, and it is Ke equals one half times the mass times the velocity squared. Forgive me for my handwriting, I know it can get sloppy. For clarification, Ke stands for kinetic energy, the mass is like weight but without the gravity factor, and velocity is basically like speed but it's a vector. Vector. And if you don't know what a vector is, it's a mathematical term, a quantity represented by an arrow with both direction and magnitude. Thank you Vector for the explanation. Now the formula roughly translates to, the heavier an object is and the faster the object is moving, the more energy the object will have. And this is basically the principle behind why SUVs and trucks are considered to be safer. Now if you have a vehicle that is twice the mass of another vehicle, which can be the case between something like a Chevy Tahoe and a Toyota Corolla, the Tahoe will have twice the amount of energy as the Toyota Corolla, which in the event of a crash means that the energy gets transferred to the Corolla and results in the Tahoe barreling through the car and its driver like a freight train. And there's one more part to the safety issues with SUVs and trucks. First though, I need to cover some more common and relatable issues, ergonomics. Now, it may come as a surprise to you, but SUVs and trucks have become massive. In fact, the Ford F-250, as I recently found out, is closer in length to a tank than to a Mini Cooper. Now, you may argue this is why SUVs and trucks are so great. They are so large, but it means that they can hold so much more stuff than basically any other vehicle. Allow me though to rewind the video just a little bit. Slow down, let me spell this out for you. Y-O-U apostrophe R-E W-R-O-N-G. You're wrong, and here's why. Let's take the Chevrolet Suburban as an example. This is the largest SUV you can buy today at something like 19 feet in length, but the Honda Odyssey minivan, despite being a smaller vehicle, still has more cargo capacity inside. And it also comes with a built-in vacuum cleaner built-in vacuum cleaner. That Suburban does not have a built-in vacuum cleaner, and the Odyssey does. Get a minivan, it's better! Which brings me to the second to last problem, the lack of visibility. You wanna see good visibility? This is good visibility. SUVs and trucks don't have it. Now, it's partially down to the design and the big pillars, which minivans don't escape either, to be fair, but it also has to do with the unnecessary height. Do you know why school buses have mirrors on the front of the hood? It's because when sitting in the driver's seat, you cannot see kids walking in front of the bus. And this same problem goes for SUVs and trucks. Car makers are happy to sell you a solution, front and cameras that eliminate the front blind spot, which is larger than you might think. CBS News did a segment highlighting this issue, and you're in for a shocker. Take a look here, nine kids could sit in front of this Cadillac Escalade and you would not be able to see them, and it only gets worse the taller a vehicle is. Minivans suffer from this blind spot issue too, but it's nowhere near as extreme as it is with these SUVs and trucks that have long, flat hoods. Unfortunately, this hood design has resulted in an increase in front over accidents, which rose right alongside the rise in SUVs and trucks. According to data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, 60 kids are run over in parking lots and driveways every week, with over 500 fatalities in the last decade. There is a proposed solution, more 360 degree camera systems and front facing cameras, and while that would help considerably, if I may offer a counterpoint, we are not supposed to use our phones while driving because it's a distracting screen, and now we are supposed to look at a screen to see what's in front? 
Wouldn't it be better to have a sloped hood design that lets you see more of what's directly in front of you while also being safer for pedestrians? You see, the other problem with the hood design of SUVs and trucks is that it is far more dangerous to people like you and I. When a sedan or a wagon or any other smaller car hits a pedestrian, it really only strikes the legs, which is bad to be fair, but the person will only be thrown onto the hood and end up with knees as bad as mine. Usually there's no extensive damage to the upper body or head where all the vital organs are. With SUVs and trucks though, because of the high ground clearance, high bumpers, and even higher hoods, even adults would get struck in the upper body, pushing them downwards so they hit their head on the road, and finally would get run over in the process because heavy vehicles are hard to stop, and the ground clearance makes it possible to go under. So we have three options. First, we could redesign the front of all pickup trucks and SUVs to be more pedestrian friendly and easier to see over. Unfortunately, this would take years to become commonplace for vehicles on the road. The second option is to instead use cameras to eliminate blind spots, but that means SUVs and trucks keep the deadly bumpers and hood design, and it would still take years to become commonplace for vehicles on the road. Luckily, the phrase three times a charm rings true. The last option is, to buy a station wagon, or a not so mini minivan if you want even more space. Unfortunately, since car makers have spent the last few decades using scare tactics and clever marketing to influence consumer demand, they've wiped out most wagons, but there are still some to choose from. Audi, Mercedes, and Volvo all still sell wagons. From Audi, there are the A6 Allroad and A4 Allroad, from Mercedes, the E-Class wagon, and from Volvo, the V90 and V60 Cross Country, and the V60 Hybrid. If you want a minivan, the choices are more limited. The minivan is the Honda Odyssey, and the other the minivan is the Toyota Sienna, which you can also get with all-wheel drive if you're looking for that. If you must buy an SUV or a truck because you live uphill both ways to where you go to work and carry mulch everywhere you go, then please be extra careful while driving. Thanks, everyone who can't afford a massive truck or SUV. If you want to know the full story about how and why car companies pushed for you to buy SUVs and pickup trucks, then you can watch this video here when it pops up. If you want to support the channel, you can go to my Patreon page, there's a link below, but don't feel like you have to. Until next time, people of the internet, peace out. And recording. Okay, there we go. And thankfully, James Spann decided to stop blowing the wind for a while. Thankfully, James Spann decided to stop blowing me for a while. <laughs> uh, I'm definitely not putting that in the video because that's a little bit too dirty. <laughs>